So, I was thinking for last last few days on the topic of Srila Prabhupada's position as the founder Acharya. We had been discussing quite in-depth, heavy issues. Now, the point has been cleared in everyone's mind. Uh, or does anybody have any question pertaining to that? Ramananda, you have a question? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Um, um, yesterday you mentioned, um, I mean, almost casually, you mentioned... Get the, get the mic. Where is the cordless mic? Oh, so where are you in saffron today? <laughs> nice. Welcome to the team. <laughs> when you mentioned that um, people don't like organized religion, you um, almost casually said, um, of course ours is different. And I was thinking, of course, when Guru Maharaj is there, everything is different. <laughs> I mean, I've been following Guru Maharaj for 30 years, 25 years, and it was always so completely different. He always come up with the best of everything. It was such an amazing experience. And, um, but still, I was thinking for the case not, you know, to be proud or arrogant or whatever, that it's important for the case of preaching that we have an explicit how we are different from um, uh, other, because sometimes when you know we go a little bit down on Kanishta level and all these things, we are not so much different that field. But we are like um, I have been like uh, one Muslim man came to visit Radish recently, and um, actually he came one year ago, and he was impressed, and then still he didn't say very much. But recently, just two weeks ago, he um, he uh, was in Antwerp in Belgium, and he visited our Radhyatra, and he followed the whole Radhyatra. And then he came back and said, actually, it's a man, it's an educator from the school that I'm teaching. And then he came to me and he said, wow, your thing is really different, huh? It's so <laughs> joyous and it's so colorful. <laughs> and that's what's one thing I was thinking, we are really different in the, like in our radiatras and our colorful culture. And uh, so I think it's nice when we can immediately have it on our mind. Yes, we are different on all these aspects. It can be important, you know, when we have to come up with it. Also, to have a clear model in our mind, how we, sh how we should be and how we should... Good point, good point. Did everyone understand the question? Because it it's leads, I mean rather, it's a continuity of something that we already discussed before. Anyway, just to give a little background, um, yesterday I mentioned that sometimes even some devotees are opposed to the idea of organized religion because they think that organized religion is bad. And in that context, I pointed out that it may be, but in our case, it's different. So Ramananda is taking the cue from that point. And, and he is asking me, to explain why it is different. Like is it just a false claim or it is real? Good point. Huh? So first of all let's consider what is religion and what is going on in the name of religion in this world. What is religion actually? Religion is the way to understand God and approach Him. Is there any religion that doesn't accept the existence of God? Huh? All the religions hmm, accept the existence of God. Nowadays, Guru they accept also groups, you know, they also call it religion, like uh, Yeah. Don't. Okay, I'll come to that. I'm just uh, 
Okay, it's all a matter of definition and understanding what religion actually is. Like, uh, what people think is not what really matters. The reality is what it actually is. Let us go to the Sanskrit synonym of the words of the word religion. What is the Sanskrit word for religion? Huh? Dharma. And what is the meaning of the word dharma? Dharma literally means the inherent quality of a substance. The inherent characteristic of a substance. Like you know, this dharma is even applied in case of water, in case of fire. Uh, like what is the dharma or inherent characteristic of water? Liquidity. So liquidity is the dharma of water. What is the dharma of fire? Uh, light and heat. Wherever there is fire, there is bound to be light and heat. Fire burns, right? This ability to burn is a characteristic of fire or dharma of fire. Uh, what is the dharma of a lion? <laughs> okay. Roar, only roar. <laughs> okay, the, the, fire, the dharma of a lion is to kill. <laughs> when you face a lion, what do you expect him to do to you? <laughs> when you face a lion, don't you become afraid? Uh, or if you face a lion, won't you become afraid? Because you are afraid that it may kill you. What is the dharma of a cow? To give milk. Uh, so in this way we can see that different mm, substance, different animals, uh, different creatures have their dharma. Different substances have their dharma. The inherent characteristic of that mm, substance is the dharma of that substance. Now, Atma is a substance. The soul is a substance. Right? So, the soul has some natural characteristic. What is the natural characteristic of soul? Uh, okay, fine. Consciousness. That is there. Uh, wherever there is a soul, there is consciousness. Uh, but when you go into the depth of it, what is the natural inherent characteristic of the soul? <laughs> huh? Okay to serve, that's fine. Okay, I'll just be brief, I'll go straight to the point. The characteristic of soul is to love. Wherever there is a soul, there is a tendency to love. But then the question is, that who to love? What is the natural tendency of the soul to love to? The soul's natural tendency is to love God. And that is the dharma of the soul. So there are two types of dharmas. One is <coughs> material concept of dharma a material concept of dharma and the other is the spiritual context of dharma. The material context of dharma is say dharma of fire, dharma of water, right? Dharma of a bird, dharma of a, a cow, dharma of a lion, dharma of a dog. So don't they have specific characteristics? Like when you think of a dog, you see what is the characteristic of a do dog? Loyalty. Uh, dog is a man's best friend. <laughs> but lion is not. <laughs> right? 
The cow takes grass, gives milk. Uh, no other animal actually does it to that extent. So this way we can see the characteristics of different uh, entities or different objects differ from each other. Even you can see like when it is water, it has a certain characteristic. Water is liquid, right? When the water becomes solid, do you call it water? When the dharma changes, that when water becomes solid, then it's not water anymore. Then it's ice. When the water becomes vapor, then it is not water anymore. It is steam. So in this way you can see that as the characteristic of a substance changes, it takes a different uh, identity by itself. So similarly, huh, with the human beings also, the dharma changes according to their nature. Like for example, those who are in the mode of human beings, those who are in the mode of goodness, what is their dharma? Their dharma is brahminical, they are intellectually inclined. Those who are in the mode of passion, what is their characteristic? Anyone? Warrior. They love, they love to fight. They don't even mind giving their life in a battle. That is the person in a mode of passion. Those who are in a mixed mode of passion and ignorance, what is their nature? To trade. Take one thing from here and sell it there. Bring it from there and sell it here. And in course, make their profit. That is a Vaishya or a trader. And what is the characteristic of a person in a mode of ignorance? Uh, he can't decide for himself what, should, what he should do. He has to be told what he should do. Uh, so this is how we see the human beings also according to the influence of the modes of material nature develop different types of characteristics. All the human beings are not the same. They develop different characteristics according to the influence of the modes of nature or their upbringing or their environment and surroundings. But when we come to the spirit soul, uh, then what is the tendency of the spirit soul? I just gave a basic idea to love. But the question is to love whom? Let's go back to the point. Uh, who is a, what is a spirit soul? A soul is a part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. An individual soul is a part of God. How, what kind of part you can say? Like uh, an example can be given like you consider sun. If you consider God to be like the sun, then the souls are the rays that are coming out of the sun. Just an example, analogy is meant for clarifying the point. Analogy should not be taken just the way it has been prepared. Krishna is compared to the sun, that doesn't mean that Krishna is sun. But it's like this is the analogy. Now, <clears throat> part, the part's existence becomes meaningful, the part's existence becomes relevant only when it is connected to the whole. When the part is separated from the whole, does it have any value? Actually not. Like for example, this finger is a part of my body. Now, if this finger is separated from the body, will this finger have any value? But as long as it is connected to the body, it has a lot of value, it has a lot of importance. Now, how does the part become connected to the whole? By rendering some function, by rendering some service. Like when this finger is connected to the body, the finger is serving the body. 
But if it is separated from the body, then it cannot serve. And then what's the use of that finger? Now how through service one becomes connected to the whole? A very classic or graphic example can be a leaf of a tree. As long as the tree leaf is connected to the tree, what is the leaf doing? When the leaf is connected to the tree, what is the leaf doing? Leaf is serving some purpose, serving something, serving the tree in a some way, doing something for the tree. It is transforming the energy of sun into the food of the tree through the chlorophyll. Isn't it? Now when the leaf stops to do that, what happens to the leaf? The leaf falls out of the tree. When it stops to render service to the tree, the leaf falls out of the tree. As long as the leaf is serving the tree, the leaf is connected to the tree. It's a part of the tree. So here again, uh, it is through service that a part become connected to the whole. Now this service, when it comes to conscious being, then that purpose of the service is actually love, an expression of love. It is due to love that one serves the whole. So the, a living entity, a spirit soul, is meant to serve the Lord because of his love for him. Okay, now let's go further. Then what is love? Huh? Actually, if you think of it, love is the most widely used word, but people do not really know what it actually means. <laughs> love is actually the most misunderstood, utilized word in this world. Why? In order to understand that, we go to the go to Chaitanya Charitamrita. Chaitanya Charitamrita is describing Atmendriya Priti Bancha Tarevoli Kam Krishnendriya Priti Icha Dhare Prem Nam. How many of you have come across this couplet? Okay. Those who haven't, please take note. It's a very important verse. It starts with Atmendriya Priti Bancha Tarebuli Kam. The desire to gratify our senses is called lust. The desire to gratify or give pleasure to our senses is called lust. But the desire to give pleasure to Krishna's senses is called love. So what is love? Love is the inherent desire to give pleasure to Krishna's senses. And what is going on? Now you consider what is going on in the name of love in most cases in this world. The desire to gratify our senses. That is not love. That is lust. In Sanskrit, uh, the word for love is prem, word for lust is calm. Atmenriyo priti mancha tare boli calm. Atme atma indriya, my senses. Priti mancha, give pleasure, desire to please my senses. Desire to give pleasure to my senses is tare boli kaam, is called kaam, lust. But krishnendriyo priti ban icha dhare prem naam. Desire krishna indriya, desire to give pleasure to krishna's senses is called love. Atoev kaam preme bohuto antar kaam andhutamo prem nirmal bhashkar Therefore, there is a vast difference between love and lust. 
Last is deepest darkness, whereas love is brilliant as the sun. So that's why I say that the word love is most misunderstood uh, in this world today. People generally do not understand what love is. What they identify as love is actually lust. Love is exclusively for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Our desire to serve Him is love. Okay, now let us go to further analysis of what love is now. <clears throat> you know what is love, Prem? Love is the inherent craving of the soul to become connected to somebody. Love is there with the soul. When you say the love is there with the soul, how do you identify that? Where is the soul situated? In the heart. The soul is situated in the heart. And, the, and where do we feel the love? Don't we say, we love with all my heart, with all our heart. We love with all our heart. But do we ever say, we love with all my brain? <laughs> brain? Things, but the soul, the mind, uh, is the brain is the seat of the mind, and with that the mind thinks, remembers, and so forth. But the soul is situated in the heart, uh, and love actually emanates from the soul. Therefore, we feel that the love is coming from the heart. So. <coughs> So that's why love is there with the soul. Wherever there is a soul, there is tendency to love. Meaning, uh, the tendency to become united, to become connected to somebody. Uh, even a lion feels the love. Uh, have you seen the lion mother, the lioness's love for her cub? She will turn the whole world upside down in order to protect her cub. In one hand, lion is such a ferocious animal. But look at the way the lion and lioness protect their children. That shows their love. Even a snake loves its babies. <laughs> so this love is there. The tendency to identify ourselves, identify oneself with its other connections. But it is actually meant to be offered to Krishna. Because through love, through this uh, tendency to become united, we want to derive our pleasure, our joy. Uh, because joy is another inherent characteristic of a living entity. And this joy is derived out of love. But when this love is offered to anyone else, does that love become fully satisfied? No. But when this love is offered to Krishna, then the heart becomes completely satisfied. When the love is offered to God, uh, then it is perfectly, completely satisfied. So now let us go to that then, as I said, like what is love? Love, as I said, that light and heat are the characteristics of fire. Wherever there is fire, the heat comes out automatically, light comes out automatically. Uh, similarly, where is soul, uh, love comes out automatically. It radiates. It's actually uh, an energy that unites. Through love, we become united. Through hatred, we become separated. Love is an energy that is inherent with the soul uh, to be connected to, that unites us, that connects us. And this 
is me the means to become connected to God, Krishna. When this love is offered to Krishna, then the love is uh, perfectly, uh, takes its perfect shape. And the heart becomes completely content. Now, one thing I want to make clear that uh, because there I see uh, quite a few newcomers. Uh, I presume you are Natasha's husband. Yeah, I'm very happy to see you. You came today? Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, so when we say God, when we say Krishna, we mean the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Person, uh, Supreme, there is no one above Him, no one equal to Him. That Personality created everything and that Personality is maintaining everything. And that Personality is the source where we all came from. Uh, like where does a ray of sun, ray of light come from? Where does the ray of light come from? From the sun. What is the source of light? Sun. Similarly, we all are spirit souls and we all are coming from the sun, from Krishna. Just as rays of light come from the sun, similarly, we the rays of consciousness, the spiritual beings, the spirit souls, we are many, but minute. We all are coming from Krishna. Now, as I said, like if the part becomes separated from uh, its origin, then what happens to the part? Its identity is lost. Similarly, when we become separated from Krishna, then we uh, begin to identify ourselves with the body, losing our spiritual identity. We don't see the light anymore, we see the darkness. Another example in this way can be when you are standing with the sun at the back, what do you see? Do you see the sun? What do you see? You see your own shadow. And what is the shadow? The shadow is the absence of sun. Isn't it? The shadow is absence of sun casted by our own uh, by our own resistance because the light is not being allowed because of this body and it is casting the shadow and we are seeing now the shadow and we identify ourselves with the shadow now is the shadow, can, can the shadow be ever identified as the self? Huh? But the shadow appears to be like the shelf, self. We lift the hand, the shadow lifts the hand. We move, the shadow moves and so forth. Huh? So our material identity is something like that which is called Maya means ignorance of darkness. Uh, because we are huh? We are facing away from the sun. We are facing away from Krishna. Uh, Krishna Surya Shamo Maya Hoy Andhukar. Krishna is like the sun and Maya is like darkness. Now consider you turn your face towards the sun. Will you see the shadow? Will you see the darkness? No. Okay, uh, so now uh, we, we are, now let us go back to Ramananda's question. Uh, religion, uh, organized religion. The problem in today's world is that religion is not, religions are not religion anymore. They have become some sort of misconstrued faith. In this respect, uh, there is an American philosopher called Will Durant made a very nice statement. Will Durant said 
that a religion remains a religion for first few years. Then it becomes a philosophy. Then it becomes a political convenience. Uh, it becomes a political convenience. And then it becomes a mere ritual. Now if we look at today's world, most of the religions have either become political convenience or mere rituals. Uh, I, am, I belong to such and such religion and this is my uh, religion. But actually what is the real religion for a living entity? Uh, we just explained, uh, you got that point. The real religion is to become connected to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the means to become connected is through love. So loving God is the only religion, the real religion. Love thy Father, Lord the God, with all thy heart and soul. If we go to the essence of Christianity, this is the real Christianity. Love thy Father, Lord the God, with all thy heart and soul. And <clears throat> what we are practicing, uh, is there any difference? Therefore, let's remember, uh, when some Christian, the Roman Catholic priest came to see Srila Prabhupada in New York and asked him, why are you converting the Christian boys and girls into Hindus? Do you know what Prabhupada's response was? How many of you know? Okay, so I'll tell you, listen carefully. Prabhupada said, no, I'm not converting the Christians into Hindus or Muslims into Jews. I am simply making better Christians out of Christians. Better Muslims out of Muslims, better Hindus out of Hindus and better Jews out of the Jews. I am reinstating them in their real religion. I am not converting them. The real religion of a living entity is to love God and Prabhupada is teaching us how to love Him. But the question is, loving God is not just a uh, way of saying things. Loving God is an is a action, is an activity. In order to love Him, we have to know who He is. Therefore, there is a need for, uh, for information about Him. Who is God? Let's find out. And the informations are there. So that is where it all starts. Prabhupada emphatically pointed out, religion is not faith, just faith. Real religion is not just faith. Real religion is a science. In what sense it's a science? Okay, now let's go back again. What's the definition of the word science? I'm sure many of you are coming from scientific backgrounds, <laughs> science students. What is the definition of science? Krishna Arjun? The materialistic perception of science? Yeah, the definition of science. Is it to methodically deduce truth empirically? Okay, close. Very close. Anyway, uh, Saraswati, what's the definition of science? Okay, also <laughs> close <laughs> the hypothesis that becomes a thesis, right? <laughs> that is after being proved. Okay, good point. Okay, if we go to the definition, I can think of two definitions of science, the word science. Science is a systematic study of a subject. Hmm. When systematically you study a subject, that is science. So systematic study of energy is physics. Systematic study of number is mathematics. Uh, systematic study of life is zoology mm, or biology, isn't it? Uh, now the science, the word science has another connotation and that is the experimentally verified facts is science. Uh, when the facts are experimentally verified, 
then it becomes science. Now you see the difference between science and faith? I can have any faith, I believe that. Nobody can contest it. <laughs> I believe that earth is flat. <laughs> well, you can have your choice, right? But when it comes to science, then you can't say the earth is flat. The science proves uh, earth is round. So these are, now, if when Prabhupada says what we are practicing is a science, what does actually, what does it mean? Uh, we are practicing something that can be experimentally verified. Uh, a systematic study of a subject. What subject we are studying systematically? God, soul, it starts with soul. First it must start with soul. We have to understand our spiritual identity. Then only we can go to the spiritual reality. And then only there is a consideration of the supreme spiritual personality. Now are we, are we soul or not? Proof. How will you prove that you are a spirit soul? Okay, Krishna Arjun seems to be eager to answer. <laughs> yeah, good, good. That brings consciousness. That brings life. This body is made of. What is our body is made of? Five elements. Huh? Okay, five elements. The body is made of dead matter, isn't it? Huh? This body. Is, is matter living or dead? Yeah. Matter, this huh? so far, huh? is it living or dead? And this table, dead matter. We say dead matter. But you and I, are we dead or living? <laughs> At least till now we are alive. <laughs> so we are living. Huh? Now what causes us to be alive? Huh? The, uh, the, uh, the cause of us being alive is the presence of the soul in the body. When the soul leaves the body, then what happens? The dead body becomes dead again. Is it surprising that somebody died? It's surprising that somebody is alive because the dead bo the body made of dead matter is functioning. Uh, in a way which is completely opposed to matter. Does this have any consciousness? Huh? Does this have any consciousness? Do I have consciousness? <laughs> huh? Like what makes the difference between me and this? Okay, then again, see how scientific the topic is. Life has six symptoms. Wherever there is life, there will be the six symptoms. What are the six symptoms of life? First consideration is birth. Uh, and then, so everything that is alive is born at some point. Right? Whether it's an insect, whether it's a plant, whether it's an animal, or whether it's a human being. Wherever there is life, born a plant a plant is born isn't it a tree is born an insect is born uh, a, a reptile is born uh, so at some point uh, it's born then what happens it grows growth a tiny little seedling gradually grows into a tree then the third consideration is change like for a tree, in autumn, the leaves fall off. And then in summer, in, in spring, the new leaves come. In summer, the trees flower. Then the flower grows into fruits. So this is how uh, changes. Now will the sofa ever change? Uh, will it ever grow some branches and 
uh, leaves will come off. Will it ever happen to that? But it happens to a tree. Because the tree is alive whereas this is dead. And then what's the fourth consideration? Fourth consideration is reproduction. Multiplication of the same species. An apple tree uh, grows apples. And then from the apple comes the seed. And in the seed there is another apple tree. Uh, in the apple tree there are fruits. In those fruits there are tree seeds. In those seeds there are trees. Uh, similarly a man and woman get married. A ch a ch children are produced. So wherever there is life, there is reproduction. So fourth consideration is reproduction. Then the fifth consideration, fifth symptom of life is decay. Somebody who is strong and powerful when he is young, in course of time he becomes, his body decays. And then the sixth is death. So birth growth, I'm sorry, birth, growth, change, reproduction, decay and death. These are the six symptoms of life. Wherever there is life, you will see that these six symptoms are there. Now the consideration is, what makes somebody alive? The presence of the soul makes us function in a specific way. Whether it's a plant, the question is, do the plants have soul? What will be the answer? Yes. Do the insects have soul? Do the animals have souls? Do the human beings have souls? So, wherever we see life depicting the six symptoms of life, there must be a soul. And when the soul leaves the body, the body is dead. <clears throat> so now you tell me what is one's real, what is our real identity is. The body or the soul? Now is there any need to study the soul? The nature of the soul, origin of the soul, soul and so forth? Yes. And the study of the soul is the beginning of religion. Religion is not some faith. It's a systematic study. And then the question, this study takes us further. A spirit soul, where does it come from? This is another subject. Very systematic study of a subject a branch of philosophy called Sankhar that analytically studies and transcends the material nature uh, and goes to the spiritual reality. In simple words, instead of going deeper into that, we can simply conclude in this way, is the soul material or anti-material? Answer. Non-material, opposed to, like soul doesn't function like matter. Uh, soul makes even matter function in a way which is diametrically opposed to the characteristics of matter. So then the soul, is the soul a product of matter or the soul came from somewhere else? The soul must have come from somewhere else. So let's go there. Where does the soul come from? Beyond this material world there is another reality called the spiritual reality. And we all came from the spiritual world. And what is the nature of the spiritual world? The spiritual world's characteristic is synonymous to the soul's characteristic. Soul is non-material. What's the characteristics of matter? Matter is perishable. Matter is temporary. So the soul is eternal. Matter is inert. Soul is conscious. Matter is miserable. The soul is blissful. 
So these are the natural characteristics of the spiritual substance. Eternity, knowledge and bliss. So that world is the world of eternity, knowledge and bliss. And in that world there is a supreme being, the supreme personality. We are persons, we are personalities with our respective identities. And there he is the supreme, he is the supreme consciousness. He is the source of all joy and he is the source of all existence. <coughs> Sat, Chit and Ananda. So now to become connected to Him. Now what is the means to become connected? How many of you remember? Very good. So when we develop our loving relationship with Him, we develop our relationship with Him, we become reunited with Him and that is the Dharma of the soul. Huh? So when it is practiced in a proper way, huh? then huh? if it is practiced collectively, because it is the dharma of every living entity, when everyone is guided in that path and directed in that, does it need organization, Ramananda Rai? Huh? Yes, when you are dealing with a mass, then there is a need of systematic, disciplined way of moving forward. Huh? Therefore, huh? organized religion is not bad. The, misapp the misappropriation of that is bad. But proper application of it is not bad. Okay, Saraswati, you have a question? Yes, Maharaj. Give the mic. What would you say to some neurologists who think that consciousness is that they are that it's coming from our brain? Because they are very, um, because this we are for us. Yes, we accept that this is a science, but they don't have the faith. So they just want to study things that they can physically prove or. Okay, good point. Good point. <clears throat> well, see, have you seen a machine? What makes the machine run? The motor. The motor moves the gears and the gears make the machine run, right? Now apparently it may seem that the motor is actually running the machine. But the question is, what makes the motor run? What is making the motor run? The electricity, right? Motor doesn't run by itself. It is the electricity that is making the motor run. Right. So similarly, in you see the what? Look at the anatomy of the body. The body is a network of nervous system, where all the nerves are culminating into the brain. Therefore, the activities of the brain and activities of the body or consciousness seems to be emanating from the brain. But the question is, where? What is making the brain function? When you go into that, then you will see. Uh, it is the soul which is activating the brain. Like for example, even when somebody is brain dead, he may be brain dead but he is alive. So if brain is the source of life, then how come he is alive when his brain is dead? Brain is dead but the heart is pumping. Right? The soul is still present. That's why he's alive. But when the soul leaves the body, everything stops. Okay. Okay, so any other question? Let's get into a question answer session because we almost discussed the topic, the proper position of the founder Acharya last two, three days. 
Yes, Anand Mohini. Give her the mic. Is it true that Shiva Prabhupada used to sometimes call his female disciple Prabhu as well? Female disciple? Prabhu. Did Shiva Prabhupada used to call his female disciples Prabhu? Because I heard. Oh no, do you call what? I couldn't get. Prabhu. Prabhu. Oh, okay, Prabhu. Okay. Uh, I never heard. I never heard that. I'd been with Prabhupada for continuously, practically for 10 months, and I never heard Prabhupada addressing his female disciples. I've heard many of Shiva Prabhupada's disciples, female disciples. Yeah, some are making a movement out of that, but you know, like, you know. And first of all, Prabhupada won't make such a big grammatical mistake. <laughs> Prabhu is a mess. Anyway, don't bring this. It's, we are discussing something else. Like, let's stick to the main point, whether Prabhupada called female disciples as Prabhu. I mean. Would you like to be identified as Prabhu? Uh, the reason I heard it was that instead of distinguishing between male and female, it's transcending the bodily platforms. But still in the spiritual sky also there are male and female. Is Radharani a female? Krishna is the supreme male. So if there is discrimination in the spiritual sky, Naturally, there will be discrimination here also. I mean, the difference of gender. Comment a few things to, a few words to your question. I mean, you asked whether I heard Prabhupada ever saying, no, I did not. But at the same time, sometimes the father may affectionately call the daughter princess, right? Or father may affectionately, affectionately may call. Prabhupada may have called. But I don't think that that should become the norm. Because the father told one girl once, princess, that now from now on all the girls should be addressed as princess. Right? So that is the point I was making. That uh, it's a cultural consideration. Like, you know, in India, no woman will be addressed as Prabhu. Prabhu is a purely masculine gender. But Prabhupada may have called somebody Prabhu, you know, like... But my point is that shouldn't become the standard all throughout the society. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes, Jeff? <clears throat> talking about science of God yeah. and uh, I wonder how we can explain reincarnation in a, a scientific way also. Oh very good, very good point. Uh, did everybody get the question? <coughs> how we can explain reincarnation in a scientific way? Okay so can I take it from the point where I ended? The soul is the cause of life. Then let us consider what is birth. The soul's acceptance of a new body is the birth. And soul's departure from the old body is death. And life is the period between birth and death. Right? Now it is the presence of the soul that makes the body alive. And when the soul leaves the body, the body dies. The soul never dies. Soul continues. And the soul transmigrates from one body to another. And you call that reincarnation. Reincarnation. He comes back to carne, flesh. The body made of flesh and blood. It's adapting a new body. That is re or return. But he doesn't come back to the same body. Right? The soul lives but doesn't come back to the same body. The same body is, is gone and finished. Uh, 
Uh, either it's buried or burnt. Uh, but the soul comes in a new body, generated in the womb of the mother. So that is the science of reincarnation, in simple words. Make sense? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Pradeep? Maharaj, I have a question. Uh, you know, it, um, everybody says that when you are connected with God, uh, you are in the Sanchita, the eternally blissful state. So, to reach there, one has to love Him completely. So, why does the same person comes away into this world? Because when He was originally there, He was all loving. So what triggers? Because when one is all love, how do you know that he is all loving? No, but I thought the characteristic <coughs> of being there means you are. All well, loving. you see, this is something that you'll never be able to understand the answer. And the Prabhupada said that the cause of our fall down to this material nature lies in the spiritual reality. So unless you go back there, you won't, you won't be able to understand it. So leave it at that. Now you are here. Try to go back. Don't waste your time trying to figure out how you came here. Because it can go on and on and on for generations after generations. You'll never be able to find the answer. It's something like, you know, whether the egg came first or the chicken came first. Can you answer? <laughs> Any other question? Yes, Krishnajan. Uh, is, it a, is it an open forum to ask anything? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Guru, I'd like to ask a question about Varanatra Dharma. Yeah. Uh, its necessity and um, how we should go about implementing it. What is the necessity for it and how we should avoid implementing it? Very good point. Very good point. It opens up another horizon. <laughs> okay, we'll try to. You see, I'll begin with uh, that with an experience that I had with Sri Prabhupada. I actually even mentioned it in one of my Vaspuja offerings. That, you see, I used to be with Prabhupada practically 24 hours a day in Vrindavan. Especially, we used to have our time, our shifts at night. And my shift was 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock at night. And sometimes Prabhupada couldn't sleep at night. And in one such night, Prabhupada was lamenting that there is so much to do, but his health is so bad. Now, mind you, Prabhupada is saying that there's so much to do after all that he had done. So I told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you should feel like that. What you have done is inconceivable. Nobody can even imagine of doing such, achieving so much. So you should simply relax. No. Then Prabhupada said, no, what I have done is the 50%. And the other 50% is to establish Varnashram. And then he said, not that everybody will become a devotee. Those who won't become a devotee, for them we need Varnashram. And then Prabhupada went on to explain that the devotees will just surrender to Krishna. And, but not that everybody will be in that platform. So, those who are not devotees, I mean, these are the devotees, those who are spiritually completely committed to serving Krishna, they are the devotees. Iskon is actually meant for them. But not that everybody will become a devotee. The society needs to be structured. And the stru for the, to make that structure, we need the Varnashram. Varnashram means the modes of material nature and one's uh, development of his character accordingly. Those who are in the mode of goodness, there are three modes of nature, goodness, passion, ignorance. 
those who are in the mode of goodness they will uh, act, they they will act in a certain way it's a nature for example a cow cow is in the mode of goodness look at the nature of the cow so gentle so giving uh, takes only grass and gives out milk uh, that is the influence of the mode of goodness a mode of passion which animal is in the mode of passion a lion and look at the characteristic of a lion a very powerful at the same time very noble lion is actually a very noble animal and so this is how due to the modes due to the influence of the modes of nature different individuals will develop different characteristics and to in, to situate them according or engage them according to their inherent characteristics the nature uh, is what is causing varnashram those who are situated in the mode of goodness they develop certain tendencies so engage them accordingly uh, they are they are thinkers those who are in the mode of goodness they are thinkers they are withdrawn uh, they are not so much into enjoying this material nature and they they are very much very generous and uh, uh, broad minded so they are one type of people their duty is to guide others and teach others then those who are in the mode of passion uh, they want to enjoy this material nature they are powerful and uh, they develop certain characteristic they want to enjoy and what they want to enjoy they want to take it um, even by force because they are powerful that's the that's the language that they understand might is right so for kshatriyas those who are in the mode of passion the warriors that's the that's their nature that's their characteristic those who are in the mixed mode of passion and ignorance they have a desire to enjoy this material nature but they do not have the passion and drive of the kshatriyas to get what they want kshatriya will go and get he'll say a kingdom oh, i like this kingdom <laughs> so he will attack or he'll make a proposal to the other king that you can either submit to me uh, or fight with me i like your kingdom and so he gets into a fight and in the fight if he wins he enjoys if he is lost bad luck for him <laughs> so that's a kshatriya's nature like a lion you can see you see a lion in the wilderness will not he may starve but will not touch an animal that has been killed by some other animal it will kill its own prey to eat whereas those who are in the mixed mode of passion and ignorance they have a desire to enjoy but they don't have the drive and the strength uh, to get what they want therefore they trade by making business by trading they make their profit and with that money they buy what they want kshatriyas on buy vaishyas will buy them, uh, for their enjoyment and then those who are in the mode of ignorance they don't know what to do all they want is to sleep right so somebody has to engage them keep them awake and make them work huh? or like in a way you can say that the, the this human society everywhere has this four classes of people those who are in the mode of goodness they are like the eldest brother Uh, those who are in the mode of passion kshatriyas they are like the middle brother vaishyas are the third one and the shudras were the youngest one and the youngest one youngest brother is not exploited by others he is <coughs> taken care of by others so that is the proper human society so this is how the human society has to be structured and that is why there is a need for varna and the human life has to be divided into four four sections 
student life, uh, married life, retired life, and renounced life. Uh, brahmachari, grihastha, banaprastha, sannyas. Does it answer your question? Thank you, Hare Krishna. Yes, Sarasat. Maharaj, you said that it is for devotees, since it's a remedy Krishna, and that's why they don't need to Varnashram. But isn't it that we are, we also have an ashram already? Um, like we are doing Vyavstak or Varnashram, so Varnashram. Yeah. So don't we automatically fall into Varnashram? We are trying to practice in the established Varnashram to create the structure. But in the ultimate sense, you know, it's not going to happen in such a small little uh, premise. Like, <clears throat> you know, that also Prabhupada pointed out that as long, I mean, in order to properly establish Varnashram, it has to be a kingdom. Because, you see, the Kshatriyas will have their own law. And Kshatriyas will have their own, you know, way of functioning, which this modern world doesn't allow. Democratic world doesn't allow. In democratic world, one doesn't have the freedom uh, to do what he wants to do. Like, you know, there, I mean, of course, this is my perception. Like, uh, my perception is that in today's world, you know, the Brahmanas, yes, Prabhupada is creating the Brahmanas. But what is lacking, is, and the Vaishyas are there and most of them have become Sutra. So in Varnashram culture, which section is missing? Kshatriyas. Because Kshat, in democratic world, Kshatriyas don't have a room. Uh, they don't have any place. Uh, democracy has come in order to, you know, to undo the Kshatriya culture, right? And <clears throat> the only semblance to the Kshatriyas in today's world that we can see are the mafias. You know, uh, of course, I got the understanding of the mafias by seeing the godfather. <laughs> Long time ago, of course. <laughs> you see, they have their own law. And what is the law? Uh, the real mafias in, in America those days, like, I mean, at least what we got from Godfather, you see, you submit to him and he will give you all protection. That's the nature of a Kshatriya. You surrender, I will give you protection, even at the cost of my own life. Now, isn't that the, the, law, the law of the mafias? I mean, originally that's what it used to be. Like, you pay me tax, I'll give you protection. And they were powerful individuals. And uh, anyway, so because they cannot function in democratic world, therefore, you know, they had to function in a kind of subterranean way, in the clandestine way. Okay, so will it take before we can have Kshatriyas? Um, do we need to first convince many more people to vote for, you know, by democratic ways to like overthrow the democracy? And how it will happen, I don't know, but it must happen. In order for Varnashram to be properly established, democracy has to go. In democratic context, you can't establish Varnashram. Because, you know, actually Varnashram believes in monarchy. And democracy came after monarchy was 
abolished. After the French Revolution, actually before that, in UK, in England it came through the Civil War. Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Hare Krishna, It's an interesting topic coming up. So for a long time I, I uh, had something on my heart. And I think uh, this is the right point to express. Maybe a little bit of explanation. First of all, I want to thank that you bring us so close to Prabhupada and to Krishna. And also because of your mood, we creating a whole family mood. I, I told her I wish we should stay here beyond the 65. <laughs> <laughs> but they go to the hotel and do things like this. But <clears throat> the point I want to make is uh, as Saraswati Bhattari also brings up and Krishna and Jung. Um, it's strong on my heart, 25 years I did book distribution, but I don't know what's happened in the last 3-4 years. I feel uh, I have to work to establish uh, a Krishna conscious community life on the countryside. It's hunting me like anything. And that's why I'm a man person, I'm an old man. But uh, the thing, what I want to say is, but I see a bit alone, alone I can do so little, although I'm extremely motivated for it. Uh, a few points made me so strong coming. One thing was when I was in South India, I did so many village programs, so many house programs, and always the Iriasas were asking me, Prabhu, where is the farm? Where is the guru who we are dying of in the cities of Hyderabad, Chennai, you know? And I, I felt it on my heart, I saw so many other families. And uh, also I was three years on Padiatra, where I totally transformed my understanding of economic management. So, now, I feel if, as our leaders, we have so many members, maybe one million, I think. And we have lands, and we have donors, Sponsors. Now, if you just have these courses, practical courses, how to build houses, how to, in small units at least, when hundred people are convinced devotees, and then the courses are there, then the transformation from the city to the countryside can be done. And then I read these quotes of Prabhupada, we will attract the people practically. And then the philosophy follows. So my thing is, uh, I, I feel sometimes we, if all the leaders concentrate totally on this re-education, practically and spiritually, we can do it very fast, small units like in Hungary, and then uh, then we can speed up the revolution. And so my question is, uh, is my vision right or the city preaching at the moment is more important or because I see many devotees dull. I don't see the light in them. Good. You know what you are trying to do? You are trying to, the way you are proposing, you are trying to lead the leaders. <laughs> you are saying what the leaders should do. They should get together, they should do this. But you have to first consider what they are already doing. Right? You may think that that is what is most important. But others may not think that way. For example, I will frankly admit, I don't think that is my priority. You know why? Because the world is not ready for that. Society is not ready for that. Because in this society, I mean we have, it's not that I had been involved as a GBC in two areas where we had large piece of land. One is Radhadesh and the other is New Mayapur. Mm. But the thing is, you know, although we tried, to become self-sufficient. I mean, that's the first thing that we need to have. Self-sufficient. Right? But the thing is that you can't become self-sufficient. You know, for example, especially in New Mayapur, I tried. There was a large piece of land. 
you know, to produce grains in field ourselves is costing more than two times than it costs in the market. That is the reality, right? Then by produ just producing grains is not enough. You need other things. You have to pay money for electricity, for gas, for everything you have to pay money. Now where does the money come from? Householders have to maintain their family. Where does the money come from? So they, instead of opting to work in the field, they went out selling paintings because that is the easy way to earn money. So how are you going to motivate people, you know, when their basic needs are not fulfilled? Uh, like you may start some small little programs here and there, uh, but I'll say also in the Western world it's abs very, very difficult, it's absolutely impossible. Uh, where the life is so hard and so expensive. Just to maintain a family how much you need. Uh, now you're a householder, uh, how much do you need? Minimum. At least 1500 euros. At least 1500 euros. Now, how are you going to get this 1500 euros unless you work? So you have to take up a job. Right? At the most you can run a business, you know, but the thing is, in order to run a business or take up a job, you have to compromise with the system that they have created. And this is the problem. The system that today's world, today's society has created to rent a house, to have a place just to live, you have to pay at least 500 euros. To buy the food that you need, you need another 500 euros. In order to take care of other bills, you need 500 euros. Just the bare minimum uh, is like that 1500 to 2000 euros. And this is what the modern society has created. Whereas when the people are living in a natural way, uh, then they had a few acres of land, they had a few cows, and they were maintaining themselves. Whatever they needed, they produced in the land. The cow gave the milk. Uh, they were not, they didn't have, you know, cell phone, they didn't have color TV, they didn't have automobiles, they didn't have all these needs. But in today's world, can you live without that? You may, but not many people will. They will want a life with automobiles, with cars, color TVs, uh, computers, cell phones, and all that. So that's why I was saying that the world is not ready for that. Mm. To implement that, you know, the world has to change. Now you may try, like, uh, you may try to create some, I won't say call it a Varnashram society, I'll call it a self-sufficient society. Live in nature, be self-sufficient. It'll be wonderful if you can do that. It'll be wonderful, but to properly establish Varnashram, we need another scenario. Okay. Right, Thank you. No, 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 no. It's no. It's good that you brought it up. No, it is right. You have done the right thing, and I am. What I am actually saying, it's a very good idea. It's a very good idea. We need it, but the world is not ready for that. And what I actually point told you at the beginning, that when you said all the leaders should get together and they should do that, that's why I said. You know, like, when you speak like that, you know, you're saying that you're going to lead the leaders. Because they have their ideas, they know what they're doing, why they're doing. No offense in that. Yeah, Vinod Bihari. Hare Krishna Maharaj. When we refer to the Kshatriyas, I will refer to them as warriors but also sometimes it's referred to as an administrative class of people who are administrating the society. But they, administ and they administrate with might, with power. The Brahmins give the direction, the ministers of the Brahmins, they give the direction, but they implement. They implement. So the, the present politicians cannot be considered as like... As a no, not the way they are. They're, they're ministers. 
isn't it? The present politicians, the ministers, they're not kings. <laughs> right? Even the prime minister. <laughs> prime minister. <laughs> but, you know, in the Varnashram society, you're talking about a king. Uh, who is actually taking the responsibility of the entire kingdom? And, you know, it has, because the kings became tyrannical. They become tyrants. Uh, they didn't have, the king's business is to protect his citizens. Bring, take care of them like their children. That is the Vedic understanding of a king. Uh, that he should treat his subjects. The Sanskrit word for subject is proja. Uh, proja means children. Those who are specially adopted. <laughs> the king treats his subjects like his children. But that was not the case in the past, in the recent past. The kings are exploiting their subjects. Like there is a famous saying, when they revolted in France, Marie Antoinette questioned, asked, why they are shouting? Then she was told, they are demanding bread because they don't have any bread to eat. She said, then why don't they eat cake? <laughs> they don't have bread, so why don't they eat cake? <laughs> so this is how inhuman these people became. And that's why they revolted and they got rid of them. And you know, in a way democracy is better than the worst, but not the best. But simultaneously, I think the Brahmin class is also missing. No? I mean, you said the Kshatriya is missing in democracy, but even the Brahmins, actually, because they are not given the position as to be the, the guiding factors. Of even the, the Brahmanas became corrupt. <coughs> Everything in that structure became corrupt. Brahmanas became corrupt, Kshatriyas became corrupt, Vaishyas became corrupt. Huh? Like the definition of a boy, of a Businessman, our definition of business was a noble art of catering to the demands of the society. Uh, the uh, trade businessman, his business is to cater to the needs of the society, and by doing that, he would make his profit. But you know what is the modern day definition of business? The business is the noble art of cheating people. <laughs> uh, so that is how it has, you know, taken the shape today. Uh, so this is how everything, all the structure has become degenerated and most of the people have become sudras. Everyone is looking for a job. And as a result of that, there is massive unemployment today. Uh, in France, 50% of the youth are unemployed. In UK even, I think 25% or 30% of the youth are unemployed. So that has become the situation of today's world because everyone is looking for a job. Yes. Uh, just to clarify your point, you said a while ago that everyone has its own dharma. So I wanted to know if you, we should understand by dharma that everyone comes to the world with a specific role in the society. I mean, you have a specific reason why you come in this world. Is it, do you, is it the same definition as dharma? What we call dharma. Uh, what I mentioned, you see, that the dharma, there is two different dharma in that context, you can say. One is the dharma of the body and the dharma of the soul. Now, what you are saying is that everybody comes with a specific role to play or specific objectives to fulfill in this world. That is that you can identify the dharma of the body, which has been designed by his karmic reactions, right? But when you transcend the bodily platform and become engaged in serving the Lord, then it becomes the dharma of the soul. 
although you are engaging the body into fulfilling the dharma, but it is uh, the dharma of the soul. Thank you right? much. Uh, okay, so any other question? This question answer sessions become quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, so th does anybody have any more question? Yes. When the soul leaves the body, how does it feel? What did Switch say? When the soul leaves the body, how does it feel? How does it feel? Yeah, what did Switch say about the thing is, is it blissful, painful? Uh, someone told me that it's really painful when the soul leaves the body. Really uh -huh. Okay. It will depend upon your state of consciousness. Right? If you feel, oh, it's such a riddance from a rubbish then you'll feel happy to leave it. But if you feel, no, 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 I don't want to leave, I want to stay, I want to stay in this body, then it will be very pain painful. Right? It is, it will depend upon your consciousness or it will depend upon how attached or detached you are to the body. If you are very attached to the body, it will be painful. If you are detached from the body, it will be easy. All right? So do you want to make it painful or easy? <laughs> okay, so what are you going to do? Try to become, yeah, detached from the body by being Krishna conscious. Okay. Any other question? Ramananda? I was thinking about, um, like, you have to implement Sri Prabhupada's Pandracharya. One of the things that came up also, you said yesterday, that when it's a good cause, it's good to be fanatic. So, but sometimes we see in the temple, and I, my, my, my perception is that in, like, living in the temples, <coughs> I've been there for... Like, Did I say it's a good... It's good to be fanatical in the, it's behind a good call. I actually was saying that enthusiastic, not fanatic. Yeah. Okay. Fanatic is blind. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's what I want, one thing I want to ask about that. That um, yes, that's that's the thing. You know, some people tend to be like pro, 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 and it gets like fanatic, and then it doesn't feel nice. And in general, yeah, you know, because it's not real. You know, yeah. it's just uh, hyped up. So that shouldn't be. And in that context, I feel like in general, the temples, uh, what we're doing in our programs, uh, the more the um, everything is clear, how, what we do and how we do it, the more it feels, it feels relaxed. Like yeah. I felt like that whole issue of guru and, and thing that comes out like, for instance, the curtains open, we pay obeisances, and nobody says something because they don't know. Well, what, but, oh, but like you do it so, or oh, like Holmes Kumar so perfectly, then we pay obeisances to Sri Prabhupada. And if we know that, when we pay obeisances, when the court is open, we know, we, pay obeisances, we, we say the pranama of Sri Prabhupada, then everybody feels relaxed. But when there is that doubt, and we have to do things together, it doesn't feel good. And when that, the problem with that, when it goes on for a long time, there's all these small things in our worship. Like for instance, when you have give the candles. Sometimes the devotees, they don't know where they have to start it from. And when it's clear, everybody knows that. So educate them very nicely. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Vashi? Yeah. Uh, Maharaji, uh, recently this week, a uh, Malaysian aircraft was shot down with 290 passengers. And many religious people were traveling in that aircraft. And uh, all those bodies are uh, spread over, still flying over there. And all these Atmas, uh, I want to say they had the right problems that uh, they were going through such a uh, way of dying. And what is that? How does the Atma leave that body and where does it go? 
I can't say. You know, like, yes. you know, like, it's not a, just a simple thing to answer. Like, every individual has his karmic background. Uh -huh. Why something happens to somebody? You have to go through his, his past, his past karma. Nothing happens by chance. Uh, when accident like that happened, we can't say it happened accidentally. Uh, like, nothing happens by chance and accident. It's very terrible that 219 people or so many religious people, I mean... But so many terrible things are happening all the time. Did you consider how many cows are being slaughtered? Isn't that terrible? You are crying that, you know, there's an uh, accident and you know, or whatever, so many people died and they were so and so forth. But do you know how many millions of cows are being slaughtered? Do you know how many babies are being aborted? Do you know how, ma how much crime is going on in this world already? But because it is, anyway, anyway it is un unfortunate, I'm not saying that it should, things like that should happen. But my point is, nothing happens by chance. Behind every action, there is a karmic cause behind it. So that means those souls who are in those bodies, they want it? No, they want it. Nobody wants to die in this way. Not that they want it. But they designed their destiny in this way. Due to their own personal activities of karma. That's why I'm saying, I'm not in a position to answer uh, like what happened to them. But I can say why it happened to them. Why it happened to them is because of their own wrong action. Therefore, act in such a way that uh, your destiny will be designed properly. And the best way to is to surrender to Krishna. And Krishna is giving the assurance. You surrender to me and I will deliver you from all your sinful reactions. And I don't know whether you were there the other day. Maybe I was speaking day before yesterday. Like, it is not that Krishna is going to save the body. When you surrender to Krishna, uh, Krishna is going to save the soul. Sometimes at the cost of the body, he may be save the soul. And an example in that context I gave was, when you go to a doctor, do you expect that he is going to take care of your shirt? The taking care of the shirt is not a doctor's business. He may even tear open the shirt in order to operate on you. Right? Just as the doctor's business is to take care of the body, and the tailor's business is to take care of the shirt. Uh, similarly, uh, Krishna takes care, Krishna's business is to take care of the soul, not the body. Sometimes he'll protect the body, sometimes he'll not. Uh, but the main thing is the protection of the soul. And it's unfortunate that things like, happen, like that happen, there's a plane crash and, you know, or whatever, you know, the plane was shot down, so many people died. You know, we pray to the Lord that things like that don't happen. But ultimately we have to consider that it is their own doing. Nothing happens by chance or accident. Yes? Maharaj, <coughs> Uh, we can understand karmic reaction reaction for a human being. How can we understand karmic reaction for mother cow? Why that being so? <clears throat> yes, the karmic reactions in the, in the animals, they don't generate their karma. Right? They are in the hands of mother nature. And mother nature actually takes care of their uh, evolution, so to say. But when one comes to the human form, then he gets an opportunity to get rid of his past karma and generate new karma. 
That prerogative only the human beings have. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, this is the word love. Love means pure and uh, unconditional. Am I right? Love is, but not lust. No, no, no. I'm talking about love. Yeah. yeah. Why yeah. Is there another, uh, why Meaning, you when the as well. when the love is offered to Krishna, then it is love. Otherwise, it's lust. Uh. But then we use pure love as well. So how purely it is being applied to Krishna? Okay. Uh, that is the current degree of purity. <laughs> Okay, thank you all very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Gaur Premanande Hare. Did 